Welcome to another episode of React Roundup. I'm TJ Van Toll, and with me on the panel today is Paige Niedringhaus. Hi, everybody. And joining us today is Carson Farmer. Carson, do you want to introduce yourself, tell people a little bit about yourself, why you're famous, that sort of thing? Sure. Yeah, I guess I'm probably not really famous yet, but maybe this uh, podcast will help a little bit with that. <laughs> so my name is Carson Farmer. I am part of the research and development team at Textile. And we are a small technology startup that's focused on building developer tools for the decentralized web. If you're a front-end developer looking for remote work, then I recommend G2i, a React and React Native-focused hiring platform that will connect you directly with their clients that need your skill set. What makes G2i a unique hiring experience is that they spend the time marketing you to their clients of your choice. G2i is a team of engineers that technically vets you up front. If you pass their vetting, their clients have agreed to skip their initial interview process, saving you time and energy getting your next gig. They take care of all the hard work for you so you can get focused on development. To join G2i, go to g2i.co and apply. So could you, for people, and I will include myself in this, could you explain a little bit about what the decentralized web is, the concept? Because I, I could certainly use like a introduction for beginners. <laughs> you bet, yeah. So, I mean... Without getting into the nitty gritty details too much, the decentralized web is basically, uh, I mean, I'm going to talk specifically about a particular um, protocol called uh, the interplanetary file system. But basically, the decentralized web is a reimagining of how the web that we use to, you know, look at web pages, communicate with one another, share you know, cat GIFs, whatever. It's a reimagining of how that might work in a way that sort of bakes into the very sort of essence of the internet, a more decentralized system. So a system in which you don't get this like centralization of power and access control and things like that, that we have with our current system. And the way it works is basically, you know, if you, if you look at the internet and the way it works today, if I wanted to access a particular piece of content, say, you know, on Facebook or some social media platform, I would have to go to that social media platform and say, you know, please, I'd like to download the picture uh, of my friend at www.example.com slash the long path to that thing dot JPEG. And so I'm referencing that information by its location, where on the internet, what on what server basically is it's stored. And that means that in order to be able to access that thing, I need to always go back to the same source. I need to say, you know, Facebook, can I please have this? Twitter, can I please have this? And if at some point in the future, they decide to change the link structure or they decide to change what's under that link, I'm going to get back, you know, whatever the new thing is. And that's, that can lead to things like link rot, where basically something that existed at a, you know, particular URL at one point in time is no longer there. And there's some kind of shocking statistics about, you know, how many links and how long over time they end up disappearing, but it's something like 90% of links referenced in like official government documents end up disappearing within a few years. So it's an actual, you know, potential problem. But the big thing is just sort of access. What if they change that link? Or what if, you know, I get deplatformed or something like that? So the, t the high level view of what the decentralized web about, about is, what if instead of referencing information by where it is stored, we reference information by what it represents. So the way that we do that is on the decentralized web, every piece of information is essentially fingerprinted with a hash function. And then when my browser or my local, you know, whatever I'm using to access this web wants to fetch some information, instead of saying, hey, you know, Google or Facebook, can I have this thing at this location? It just says, hey, network in general, I want the thing that looks like this. And then whoever happens to have that information can send it back to me, sort of like torrenting. And so that means that I no longer have to go to the specific source. I can go to whoever, happen, whoever else on the decentralized web happens to be storing or um, seeding the data that I'm looking for. It's interesting. So you're saying like the, obviously the, the files themselves would still have to live somewhere so is there some sort of strategy where, I mean, this almost sounds like, like you mentioned torrenting, it almost sounds a little like Bitcoin to me as well, uh, in a sense, because it's sort of decentralized. Would it be because obviously not everybody in the system would have, could have like a total copy of the entire internet. So it, there'd be some strategy where like everybody in this system would store like some chunk of these files, or I'm, I'm sort of trying to wrap my head around 
how these files would still actually end up stored so that if you wanted to get it by this fingerprint again, how that would actually work. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So certainly it's not a magical you know thing where you just have it on the cloud. Someone has to store that data. And so actually IPFS, the one that I, you know, the sort of system I'm specifically referring to here is a bit unique in that respect. So, you know, off the top, there are actually quite a few different systems that you might be interested in. There's, but the way that IPFS works is essentially you are only ever going to provide or seed data that you have accessed. So if you're sitting there on your you know, desktop and you're um, accessing, say, a particular web page over IPFS, and you've now viewed that web page and you've enjoyed it, and it's just um, now sitting in your local cache, now the next person that comes along and wants to view that same web page, they can either pull it from you or whomever else has potentially recently visited that page. So you essentially are only caching things that you're accessing. What that means is that things that are popular are more readily available uh, for the rest of the network and things that are very unpopular, you know, like your own personal diary or something like that, will be much less likely to be easily routable by the rest of the network. So in order to fix that problem, there's a couple of different solutions, but one of them is basically just adding an incentive layer to store things. And there are services called pinning services, which you can say, look, I've got a particular data set that I think is really important. I will pay this third-party service to pin it or to seed it to for whoever wants to access it. Or, and we can get into this a little bit later if we want, things like Filecoin exist as, a, as an incentive layer on top of IPFS and similar systems. And Filecoin is essentially a blockchain, a sort of unique blockchain solution for actually incentivizing businesses, individuals, and companies to store and have data available. So IPF, IPFS, Interplanetary File System, that's a heck of a name, first of all. I haven't heard of it before. Would I, am I thinking of this right? Would this be like almost like a competitor to HTTP? Is, is that sort of, do I have the right mental mindset for this? Totally, yeah, exactly. This is, you know, this is effectively like a new protocol like HTTP that is designed essentially from the ground up to to try to shift away from a pure like client server call and response model to more something more like torrent at the actual base web and internet level. So exactly that's 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 exactly right. I'm curious too, so how much of this is just because I, I haven't heard of any of this coming into this, could you s- like how much on the scale of like this being like a little experiment to this being like a full scale production use, like how far along in the process is this? Like, are there real people using this? Is this like a sort of an academic experiment at this point, somewhere in between? I would label it as, I think if you ask, so there's a company behind it uh, called Protocol Labs. Protocol Labs is also the company behind Filecoin. And Filecoin, I believe, was one of the largest ICOs during that whole ICO phase, where a lot of different blockchain and coins were coming onto the scene. So they're fairly well funded. And IPFS has been around for since about, I want to say 2013. So it's no longer, it's it's shifted from pure academic experiment to, I'd say, beta quality, beta level software at this stage. There are multiple companies, including, you know, our textile that are building business models on top of IPFS and its underlying technology. There is quite a bit of interest from some larger, well, I mean, Netflix has has actually contributed code and concepts and usage to IPFS for essentially syncing data across uh, data centers. So actually a lot of very large technology companies that need to sync large volumes of data between data centers use either IPFS or a similar uh, content addressed uh, concept just so that they don't have to worry about do you know shifting data from here to there instead they can just say i want the data that looks like this over here so there's some you know there's some benefits across there too it's not just a sort of consumer level uh, piece of technology that's really interesting so could you can you access the decentralized web through a regular web browser like chrome or firefox or does it need a special browser to be able to get to it? 
That's a that's also you guys are on fire here. So <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. So the way that it works is in theory, if we wanted like a pure IPFS or decentralized web browsing experience, you would access data using the IPFS. So instead of HTTP colon slash slash should be slash IPFS. And that would be, you know, the sort of like ideal framework. If there are browser plugins that allow you to do that directly for Chrome and Firefox and Safari, I think all the major browsers actually. Also recently, Opera on Android has released native support for IPFS protocol and a few other crypto and decentralized web protocols. And then in order to sort of bridge that gap, because not all browsers do ship with an IPFS capable peer, there are also things like gateways. So gateways are essentially IPFS peers uh, that are running their, on servers uh, across the cloud um, that speak both IPFS and HTTP. And so what you can do is you can request content on IPF, uh, via IPFS through these gateways, and then just a regular browser is able to display that data um, using all the nice optimizations that browsers are, are good at without necessarily speaking IPFS at the low level. And then, yeah, there's browser plugins to make some of that possible. And then you can also run a local IPFS peer on your desktop or in some cases, even your mobile device. And then um, you can actually just connect to your local gateway. So you can kind of turn your own laptop or whatever into a gateway as well. Oh, that's very cool. Yeah, it's nice. You know, a lot of the, the developer community around IPFS are, you know, there's... We're a, little, we're a little less worried about being the sort of purist, like, oh, it has to be purely decentralized. You know, you have to be pragmatic if you're trying to, you know, kind of reimagine how the internet might work. There's, there's phases that that has to happen, and it's not a light switch. So the gateways are a great way um, to start to make that happen. And our team spends a lot of time trying to make sort of existing Web 2 you know, if, if the, that's what you want to call our web that we have today, the web two sort of developer tools and experience feel, you know, as we transition to web three, it still feels like a web two kind of experience. You know, a big part of what our, how our team thinks that this shift to a more equitable and decentralized web might happen is it's not going to be because your everyday internet user necessarily cares about this. It's going to be because developers find, you know, useful tools and find it easier to deploy websites and find it easier to deal with user data um, and they build better experiences and the users come that way. Um, and that's often the way that these sort of technology changes happen. So Carson, how did you get into it? Because this is something that I'm not, is not even on my radar really as a developer. So how did you get started with this? Cool. Yeah. I mean, our team, and just to highlight, we've, we've got a small team, but there's myself, Andrew Hill is the um, CEO and Sander Pick is the CTO. And then we have Aaron Sutula and Ignacio. Um, and we're all kind of came at this from different uh, perspectives and angles. And But ultimately what it did is it solved a specific problem for us. IPFS you know, was a sort of like, that's the thing we need to solve this problem. And that problem was a lot of our team was really interested in some of the issues around data privacy and data sovereignty and, and data control on the internet. And, you know, I, to not to beat a dead horse, but, you know, you know, all the issues around Cambridge Analytica and a lot of the stuff that we've been seeing over the last couple of years, you know, if, if you sort of take what's going on there and then extrapolate, okay, if that's what we have now, what's the, like, what is this sort of eventual future we might see if things keep going the way they go? We just didn't really like what that was going to look like. And so we started uh, as a company trying to figure out what, what could we do technology-wise to build a sort of better future for people's private data and for their social data and for you know, their data on the web in general to make it so that people could control it better. And one of the big pieces that came up was basically if you didn't have to go to a particular location to access your own data but rather could just reference what your data is, i.e. content addressing, then you can suddenly start to imagine a whole bunch of new scenarios, new like development scenarios, new user scenarios, in which I have a lot more control over who and what has access to my data. So that's how we, that's, and I can talk about that thing all day um, if you want, but 
that's how we came to this space is really as a technological, a piece of the technological solution to solve a pretty, you know, uh, like fundamental problem about user data. Yeah, I'm actually, you sort of anticipated my next question because I'm sort of curious, like the specifics of that. So considering this is a decentralized system and content is being hosted by potentially multiple different nodes or people or whatever, how does the protocol ensure that, say, like I upload a private picture to a social network, something that's supposed to be gated to a few people? How does the protocol ensure that like that picture um, doesn't get hosted by, say, my neighbor, whoever has it on their device? I, I just I'm sort of curious how that works. That's an interesting piece of the puzzle because at the sort of low level layer, IPFS, the protocol, it doesn't really care who has what, right? It's just like, I want this data and it uses a protocol called bit swap, swap bits of that data back between peers. So that very low level IPFS layer doesn't really care about that. Just like HTTP doesn't really care about access control in the, broad, in the, in the broadest sense. And that's, so that's where textile comes into play. And so we provide a bunch of tools for developers to essentially model that sort of access control behavior on top of IPFS. And another nice way to think about IPFS is essentially it is a, f- I mean, it's called the interplanetary file system. It's meant to be treated like one giant file system that the entire you know, universe of, or, well, maybe not the universe, but it's interplanetary. So I guess our solar system could potentially access where it's one giant file system and you're going to like request files and things like that that you know about based on their, their, their content. And so you can start to imagine, okay, if, if we have this one big file system, just like on your local laptop, you can do things with that file system, like you can run a database and store database updates on that file system. And just like your file system doesn't necessarily, you know, it has some access control tooling built in, but the file system itself doesn't necessarily care so much about that. So the applications built on top of it are what provide access control and encryption and things like that, that then enable that very specific private sharing of data. So we have a product that we call ThreadDB, which is a database built on top of IPFS that is distributed, but that provides access control and encryption tools so that I can add something to IPFS and I can share it with a small group of you know, collaborating peers or just with family members or something like that. And that database, may, uh, the table in that database may con- you know, include my photos and comments about those photos and so on and so forth. And the idea there is basically, we already have that, right? That's like how you use, that's how you build web apps today. In many cases is you've got some front end and then you've got some back end with the database. Your front end, you know, modifies some state. That state gets um, updated on your back end. And then you access that. And other people can access that and blah, blah, blah. And so you can model that very similar operations in a decentralized way where I have the web page in front of me. I modify some state. That state gets synced across peers. But of course, only the peers that are actually interested in that particular piece of state and then, and so on and so forth. So with, you know, like, now I'm not saying you should just build the web two version of things on the web three, but like imagine a sort of Facebook like thing where I've got my profile, I modify that profile and I update it. And any one of my friends that have, you know, linked up to me in some way, however, the sort of UI does that, they would then be notified, okay, Carson has updated his profile and, you know, here's the latest state. The really cool thing there and something I didn't mention about IPFS specifically yet is while it is all content addressed and decentralized, it's also peer to peer. So in theory, I could actually get those updates directly from who, whoever actually created those updates. And in practice, that doesn't always work because you know if it was a mobile device, I probably already stuck it in my phone. My phone's turned off, so I can't pull that update from your phone anymore. So Textile also provides a bunch of essentially like always on cloud peers that do a lot of the proxying and route, routing for people so that even if they do pocket their phone, their, you know, their updates and state and data will still be available. Yeah, I was actually going to ask about how that works with cache invalidation. Like 
you know, if one person has it, but then whoever actually owns the piece of content updates it, how do you prevent somebody from getting the old view, view or content or whatever? Well, that yeah. So in any peer-to-peer system, that's totally a possible state to end up in. Mm-hmm. And there are a bunch of... And so that's an interesting problem, right? Because there's actually two problems there. One is, yeah, like stale state. And, you know, that's entirely possible. And the, the assumption is if you have a you know, if you're able to access the web in general and you have a good enough connection, eventually you'll get the, the latest state. But it is possible that you'll get out of date or you might even get things out of order. And so, and ideally when I make a change on, you know, my local peer or I'm using some, you know, the cloud, some cloud infrastructure and it's making updates across other peers, ideally we get that all in the same order and the right order and everything works great. But, you know, the internet's sometimes flaky, so that's not always the case you might get things out of order. And it might be just like a diff, right? Because you don't want to be sending full state for every web page that changes all the time. So you want to just send small updates. And if you don't get those in the right orders, things can happen. So there are a couple of really cool things that have happened over the last decade, which have made things like these decentralized updates and peer-to-peer systems a lot more usable. Like a lot of this tech has been around for a while you know, torrents and torrenting and the concepts there have been around for a long time. And some of the sort of like data structures and, de- and you know, decentralized hash tables or distributed hash tables, these things are not new concepts. But what is new is that they've all kind of gotten to a mature state at the same time. And they're now usable. And we've seen some systems and how they work and didn't work. And so a lot of the best in, you know, best in class and best practices have come to sort of come to a head right now. But another really enabling technology is something called um, CRTTs or conflict-free replicated data types. Or there's variations on that name. So if there's someone listening and they're like, that's not exactly what it's called. Yeah, I know, but they're, you, you use your version, I'll use mine. But anyway, what these do is these are data structures that, in theory, as you update them or as you add operations to them, like say you've got a, a CRDT set, a set object. As you make updates to that set, if they arrive in different orders, but like you and I both have the same, the same set CRDT running locally, and we get the same updates, so eventually we get all the same updates, but we get them in different orders, we should arrive at the same final state, no matter what. Now, of course, you can't make any expectations that if we don't receive the same updates, you know, our state won't be the same because we don't have the same information. But assuming eventually, so these are called eventually consistent data structures, assuming if we eventually get all of the same data, even if it's out of order, we'll arrive at the same state, which is really cool because now if you and I are accessing the same web page and updates are happening and, you know, I go into the subway and I come out and I get a new update, blah, 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 uh, eventually we will see the same web page or the same you know, database structure or, or whatever. I love the term eventually consistent. I hadn't heard that before. And that's pretty amazing. <laughs> yeah, it's in, you know, we love working in this space because there's so many cool new ways of doing things when you start to like think about things in terms of just really, you start to think of, about things less in terms of like the full back end system. And you start to think of things as like every piece of the front end is also its own backend. And it's actually quite a simplifying concept because now I only have to kind of model my system after potentially like one user and their experience at that one time. And then the rest of the state kind of can be this like sort of decoupled set of a bunch of users. And then it starts to really kind of get interesting and you can you get to sort of think like, okay, well, what if we relax the requirement that like, updates are instantaneous because we have CRDTs, which will be eventually consistent. So there's a lot of really neat things that you can start to do there. And Andrew has put together some cool examples where we actually, you, you basically plug a thread DB to like your Redux state in a React app so that you could actually have two people looking at the same page and use your, your Redux state to like represent, you know, like a game or some some sort of like visual representation of the page. And then as I make a change and that gets propagated to other peers, their state automatically changes and it's synced across devices. And so now suddenly you have like a really nice framework for collaborative games or collaborative document editing and things like that. 
And the cool thing there is you really are designing it around like the state ma management for a single app, but it starts to sync across all these other devices, kind of like quote unquote for free. I mean, there's a lot of work going on in the background, obviously, but yeah. So it's almost like an alternative to WebSockets. Yeah, I mean that. Yeah, so you can use WebSockets as one of the protocols that it that it speaks it, it speaks to um, sync. But yeah, in in, the, in browsers and stuff, that's that works really nicely. In fact, we our team kind of designs a lot of our specific textile tooling on top of IPFS. We design that with WebSockets in mind, just because you get that bi-directional flow that um, makes all that communication quite nice. Hey folks, are you trying to figure out how to stay current with React Native? Maybe you heard the Chain React conference was canceled and you're a little bit sad about that. Well, I borrowed their dates and I'm doing an online conference. So if you want to come and learn from the best of the best from React Native, then come do it. We have people like Christopher Shadow from Facebook. He's going to come and he's going to talk to us and answer questions about the origins of React Native. We're also going to have Gant Laborde from Infinite Red and several of the panelists and past panelists from React Native Radio. So come check it out at reactnativeremoteconf.com. That's reactnativeremoteconf.com. That's actually a perfect segue because I was going to ask, how does React fit into all of this? Are you guys using it as part of your front-end framework or is it just more of a general JavaScript uh, thinking way? Well, there's two ways that we think about that. One is, so most, we don't, we're more of the sort of library and tool builders. So all of our libraries are either, we, our reference libraries are mostly Go. And then we write JavaScript, either clients or like lighter versions of those so that they run nicely in browsers and ideally in React Native and things like that as well. And so from a UX perspective, we, our team is, and a UI perspective, our team builds examples and components and things in React. And we're pretty big fans of, oh, I'd say I'm a very big fan of the new, a lot of the new React, like context and reducer framework. And I mean, that's just like very well conceptualized and designed. And one of the things we're super excited about is that that framework just fits so nicely into essentially what you'd have is like you have your 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 threads your thread db as your distributed state and you have that sitting there and you know there, there's similar flows for like firebase you, you know you can think of threads thread db sort of like a firebase like equivalent but there's similar flows where you have your firebase database sitting there and then you've got your reducers excuse me you've got your reducers and all of your, you know, if you've got side effects and things like that, that are modifying that state. The only, the cool thing here is that that state can then be, part of that state could be replicated across another collaborating peer. That state could just be stored, you know, locally for that particular user, or you can distribute it across multiple peers. So there's like a lot of really interesting ways where you can have pretty fine grain control over what part of the state gets replicated or gets synced across peers, what part doesn't. And that whole flow fits really nicely into, you know, kind of how we designed our systems. So, and I can't help but think that, you know, Re React ends up influencing how we design that a little bit as well, just because of that. And then actually, um, Andrew started playing around with RxJS as well and observables, where you, because you can essentially just plug a thread database, it's, it's an event emitter, right? Because, I, and that makes sense because if someone modifies state somewhere else, I want to be notified of that state change via an event. So you can plug that event in and treat it as, a, as an observable. And then you can have your whole state, you know, update and modify based on events that are happening on a different peer in the same room or across the room or, you know, across the state. So, yeah, I mean, so to answer a long-winded version of that is, yeah, I think React's inf React influences how we design our, our JavaScript libraries. And then it also sort of plays really nicely, I think, with that, you know, you design for that local, that local peer, but then have that state kind of replicated across multiple peers. Another question I have, I guess it's kind of related, is what do you see as the main sort of incentives for someone to switch over to like an IDFS approach? And I ask this, like my mindset here is like, some of the examples you've given so far are like the Netflixes of the world or moving data between data centers, which I can sort of see the value of that, but it's also kind of a niche thing. Like it's like your average developer probably listening to this isn't, you know, a 
Google engineer that's working and moving data from one data center to the other. Is there an incentive for like your, say, your average developer working on um, web apps that's super comfortable with HTTP today? Like what's their sort of incentive to check this out or look into this? Is it like maybe like a, more of a short term or long term? I, I guess I'm just sort of curious how you view that. I think there are three legs to that stool that I'll try to pull apart. So, and one, some are shorter term and some are longer term. The longer term one I'll bring up at the end, and that's the one I, I think I am and probably my whole team is most excited about. But the first one is when a developer doesn't need to worry about where something is stored, and all of these things are sort of tied together, but when a developer doesn't need to worry about where things are stored, then they can start to get a little bit more creative about things like how they treat user data and some of the rules around GDPR and things like that. So, and potentially, if you're designing your app so that you don't really have a backend anymore, you just have like a front end where your, your user's data is being synced across devices or things like that directly peer to peer, you can worry a little bit less about like your backend infrastructure storage, storing passwords and things like that. And one of the big things that, you know, people think of when they think of decentralized web is crypto stuff. And that's not necessarily the case. That's like one piece of a, of, or even a different angle on decentralized web. But you do, because that technology is coming along at the same time, you do start to get things like, you know, quote unquote, universal or decentralized identities. So one thing that we're seeing starting to happen now is that users are able to have, you know, identity, I think is not the right word, but some representation of a user, like like their ID, their public keys and all this stuff. It's now a lot easier to bring that stuff with you across different apps. And so a new app that comes along that says like, I, you know, I want to provide an awesome experience for my users. When their users come on board, they may already have essentially a username that they want to use with that app that may be tied to a blockchain, may be already stored on IPFS somewhere else, whatever. But now suddenly that app doesn't need to worry about the infrastructure required to have user information, to have, you know, you know, profile data, to have all of these things, because maybe some other app has already provided that, or maybe, you know, that user is just storing that stuff locally, or maybe they're using Filecoin, you know, all this stuff could in, in theory seamlessly coexist. But suddenly a, an app developer doesn't need to worry as much about that backend infrastructure. So now privacy is a little bit less of a, a big deal. And it's easier to like satisfy GDPR requests and things like that. Coupled with that, now suddenly you have this really potentially interesting framework. And I, I, I think I gave you a link to a talk that um, I gave at Ethereum Denver a while back, where essentially you can think of this as like users bring their own data to the applications that they interact with. This is starting to get a little longer term, but the technology exists to do this already, which is I'm a user and I download your app and I don't know, it's a photo app, right? And I take some pictures with your app and those pictures get added to my local IPFS peer and then they get added to my like photos profile. Okay. And that's stored on IPFS and we use thread DB because I'm going to plug my own thing, obviously. And that sort of thing is um, available. Now, a new, a new app comes along, and it's a photo filter app, okay? just a, That's all it does. It just it does really awesome filters, and you can put bunny faces on people. So in our existing Web2 world, that new app is never going to compete, right? Because there's already an app that has all of the data, has all the photo data, and they're just going to add the feature to add bunny ears to those photos, right? But in a Web3 world, or at least this Web3 world we're talking about here, where users bring their own data around with them, that's not necessarily the case, right? You don't have this walled garden anymore. Now you have a sort of like big open plane. And so my new app can come along and I can say, look, I will put bunny ears on all your photos if you want. You know, you just have to acknowledge or give access to, to those, those particular photos. So there's where the access control piece comes in. And now I can write an app that's just like really darn good at putting bunny ears on photos. And I can provide that as a nice service for the user and they can sort of um, access that. But if, even if I had no users to begin with, my users are going to download that app and they've already got their photo data there. They don't need to take new photos. They don't even need to you know, worry about if this is a like social network, you know, there's some social aspect to it. They don't need to worry about crickets and an empty social network because 
potentially all of their social network connections that they've you know established in prior apps are there with them as well. So for a developer, you basically get like this, you get network effects kind of that aren't ones that you gathered and collected in your own walled garden. They're network effects of the entire network. And so you can bootstrap up a new app pretty quickly without even having your own data structures. You could build on top of the data structures of other applications. And one thing we kind of envision envisage for longer term stuff is like popular apps will essentially like publish what their uh, user data structure looks like so that other applications can import those modules and request access to those. And now you're starting to think of like, this is sort of like an iCloud type experience or like APIs built on top of, you know, Facebook or Twitter APIs, but where you don't have, you're not beholden to Facebook or Twitter, you're beholden to the user who created that data. And then suddenly developers don't need to worry about like, well, I'd love, I got this great idea, but like, I can't compete because I don't have the users. Now your users will bring, you know, their content and stuff with them. You know, this is, that's longer term stuff, but like the technology to make that happen exists today. So that's, that's another big sort of motivator there. I really like the idea that users own their own content and their own data. And that's not, you know, owned by Facebook, by Twitter, by Instagram, but, and this is just me thinking from kind of the more, the company side, is that going, that is got to affect and scare companies like that, that do have so much of our data and Google even just, you know, owning what we search for, what we knowing so much about us, there's got to be companies that don't want that to be a possibility and don't want users to know they could be the ones who are in control of their own content. Yeah, I imagine so. Yeah. It's any, but, and of course, that's the case for any sort of new direction or new technology. It's, you know, there's a lot of people who have invested a lot of time and money in our current system. And, you know, I should, I should mention that there's a lot of really great reasons why centralized sort of access control and things like that are useful. And that's not going to go away, right? Like the web that we have now works really great. And there are a lot of really great reasons to have like a, a centralization of resources. So not everything is going to, you know, is going to happen that way. And I think there's still going to be, you know, probably reasons to have companies that aggregate information in order to provide better user experiences or, or what have you. But the other piece of that is, I think, you know, in a lot of senses, the web that we have now is a bit of a lazy web in terms of business models. You know, we're kind of resting on our laurels that like the way that you make money on the internet is by selling advertising and by using people's data to make it better to, or easier to, and more accurate to sell particular advertising. And don't get me wrong, sometimes when I'm not using some social platform and I get an ad, ad and I'm like, you know what, I actually, like that's relevant and I, it's useful and I'm, I might actually go buy that thing. Like sometimes that's a, that's a great experience. Sometimes I want that. Oftentimes I don't. And I particularly want to know what about me is being used in order to drive that ad. But sometimes that's a good user experience. But I think it's not the only business model that we should be exploring on the web. And if you think about like all the major platforms and all the things, it's like it's pretty lazy from the perspective of their, I'm going to make a bunch of biz dev people really angry, but, you know, there's like there's other ways to make money on the Internet. And I think we're starting to see a little bit more of that as this sort of crypto world is also becoming more popular. And I'm not saying we all need to go out and buy Bitcoin and trade Bitcoin and, and that, but, you know, like the Ethereum world is pretty interesting in terms of like, you know, paying for like access and to do operations in apps in these like tiny micro payments is an interesting one, like selling and buying and obtaining digital assets. The gaming world is starting to embrace things like owning it, like property and owning like this, you can, there's things called NFTs and things in games where you can basically like own a digital asset. You can own a character in the game that you're playing, right? Like there are new kind of ways and new models that we're seeing as the web develops that are a lot more exciting to me than just selling advertising. And I think we're going to start to see that happening a lot more as well. So the, the folks that are scared about, and, you know, that makes sense, would be scared about changes to how, you know, the web might operate you know, I think they're going to start to have to explore more interesting ways of interacting. I mean, we used to all pay for software not that long ago. 
And then suddenly we stopped paying for software and we thought that was awesome, but we didn't really think about like, why don't I have to pay for this anymore? Because someone is getting paid to do this. And it turns out I didn't have to pay for it anymore because I was giving my data up. So I think, you know, people are not as concerned about privacy as I would, like I implicitly think people would be because I care about it, but people do care about user experience and people do care about like being surprised and delighted. And I think new business strategies that don't revolve around selling ads are going to provide that surprise and delight. We're not there yet, but it's it's starting to happen and that's pretty exciting. So Carson, I'm curious for anybody listening to this here that like you completely sold them on it. They're they're ready to to jump straight in. They're they're super convinced. Where would you recommend like what's your pragmatic getting started starting point? Like if I'm just rank and file developer, I just want to tinker with the technology. Where do I go? What do I do? Yeah, that's that's awesome. So I really hope that, and, and our team is getting, there, is getting there pretty quickly, I think, because I really hope if you come to textile.io, you come to our GitHub pages, what we spend a lot of time trying to optimize for is developer experience. So, because, you know, in, this, in this, this conversation alone, I've thrown out a ton of like buzzwords and new ideas and new concepts that like people are going to have to Google or whatever to learn more about. And personally, I don't think that, you know, a small startup tech shop is going to like say, you know what? Okay, everybody, we're just going to like take two weeks to learn all these new concepts. No problem. Let's not ship this next two weeks. We're just going to, you know, that's not going to happen. So what we want, what, you know, what I really want is for dev teams to be able to pick up some tech, some textile tech and start to integrate it reasonably smoothly into their existing you know, developer flows, which, you know, be that a React app with a firebase like you know, database that syncs to a backend, like that flow should hopefully remain reasonably similar, but in the background is starting to take advantage of a bunch of these Web3 decentralized web technologies. And then once they're like, okay, this works pretty well, this is kind of cool. Now they can start to say, okay, like, well, what actually is happening in the background here? I'm going to go to the libp2p.io webpage. I'm going to go to ipfs.io I'm going to go, you know, look at and learn a little bit more about what's like really going on so that I can tweak that textile experience a little bit. So, you know, that's kind of where I'd like uh, to get us going. Another thing that I'd really love to um, see people kind of look into is things like go to IPFS.io, join the IPFS. There's like Discord and like IRC and all that kind of stuff, which I can give you guys links to so you can share those. We've got a Slack channel. The big thing is like, just ask questions. What's so great about IPFS? How does it compare to like torrenting? Those like ask the community those questions because there's a bunch of pretty cool, passionate people who will give you like a good answer, non non snarky answer. And to be honest, and one of the reasons we started using IPFS, the technology is because the community is actually really a very good welcoming one. There's people writing blog posts about how to do this simple thing on IPFS, how to do, you know, how to build a React app with IPFS, you know, there's a lot of that. So join the communities, get involved that way. And then the last thing is try to find, you know, companies that are building on top of IPFS that are bridging the web two to web three gap. So like textile is doing that. We're going to have some tools so that people can start to, you know, actually save data using Filecoin which is this incentivizing layer for storing data, but with this like common database flow. But also there's companies like, you know, Pinata and Rtrade where where they have like S3 compatible APIs that store data on IPFS. You know, so it's like you don't need to necessarily dive right in. Like if if you are convinced and you know, that's awesome. But if you're even slightly skeptical then yeah, try some of these other sort of higher level libraries where you can sort of you know just swap basically what backend your S3 API is hitting and you can start to reap some of the benefits. And I think there's a lot of ways to dip your toes without necessarily flicking the switch. So that's, that's my take home point, I think is like, there's a lot of ways to start to dip your toes without having to go full bore decentralization. Awesome. Are there any topics that we didn't get to today? Anything else you want to quickly mention? I feel like that was a pretty good 
spot to wrap up on. Yeah, that was a lot of stuff, I'd say. But for sure, you know, if anybody is interested, the Filecoin stuff, Andrew Andrew is the one to talk to about that. So maybe next time he's around. But uh, for sure, you know, if people are interested in that, they should check out Filecoin. The main net is going to be launching this summer. And our team is working hard to basically make it so that IPFS and Filecoin play really nicely together, but then also these sort of common Web2 APIs. So like, it should be pretty easy to say, create some user data and it goes into the database and they've got some profile and then to flush that to Filecoin. And the really cool thing here is developers, so I mentioned, you know, developers don't necessarily want to worry about, you know, backend stuff. And that we're starting to get to the point where like, you don't need to worry necessarily about user data and things. But in some cases you do, right? You want to provide a really solid user experience where you guarantee that their data is available, you know, for how long, blah, blah, blah. So there's some really cool models where now developers can essentially like allocate Filecoin or whatever backend system that happens to be. Filecoin is a sort of same works with IPFS, but uh, where a developer can allocate funds on behalf of their user and the, the, the developer suddenly all sorts of really interesting business models open up. So the developer can say, look, if you're using my app, the first X gigabytes are free. And then on top of that, we'll store it for like seven days. And if you want to like make that data permanent, you got it, you click the like permify button. And you know, that costs X amount of dollars to store your data. So you can get these, these much smoother onboarding experiences where users can start to use the applications right away. But instead of like paying that the five dollars a month kind of fee to you know store more data on iCloud or whatever, you can start to see like kind of pay as you go scenarios or like set a maximum like amount that you want to pay up to or set like you only want to store files for I don't know if it's like photos, you're not going to look at certain types of photos after you like took the photo and showed it to your friend, right? So like okay, I only want these types of photos just hang around for a certain amount of time. But like if I tap a photo, I want that to last longer. So you can start to like have very fine tuned control of like what you do and don't keep and what you do and don't share. And a lot of that stuff where users have a little bit more control. And then the developer can provide reasonable defaults so that the user isn't being bombarded with, you know, questions constantly. But, you know, so Filecoin is a really interesting one. I, I recommend people check that out. And again, our team spends a lot of time trying to make Filecoin, map Filecoin onto the way developers think about storage now. So Dexcel is a good place to start, but any place is a good place to start, really. Are you freelancing or moonlining? Or maybe you've thought about going out on your own. Every week, we have a group of developers at various stages of the freelancing journey on The Freelancer Show to talk about becoming better at freelancing. We also bring in experts to talk about marketing, SEO, and delivering high quality to clients. So if you're interested in going freelance or you are freelance, check it out at freelancershow.com. All right. So I think on that note, why don't we uh, move on into the picks? So Paige, you want to start us off? Sure. My pick this week is going to be a TV show that's actually in its third season that we've been watching recently called Killing Eve. It's on BBC America. I think it might be on AMC in the US and Hulu. And it is just a really fantastic drama series that's set in mostly in England. And the characters are just, they're, they're nuts and they're so much fun and interesting to watch. It's a little bit gory at times, but it's really, really interesting. So if you are looking for something more to binge watch while we're all still on lockdown or coming out of it, I would, I would recommend that one. Awesome. So I've got one pick today for uh, Recoil, the library Recoil, which is something that um, I'm trying to remember the guy's name now. I'll put it in the, the show notes, but had a talk at the Virtual React Europe. And it's basically a state management tool for React for sharing state around components. So it's, it's, uh, it's an interesting new approach because I, I'm still relatively new to React. I've only been doing it for a few months. And that's something that I struggled with like right off the bat. I found context in React, super confusing. So I've, I've only experimented with it a little bit, but I've liked what I've seen so far. So if you also don't like state management across components, it's something worth checking out. And I'll toss the links in the show notes. So Carson, what picks do you have? Cool. Well, I think I'm going to go with a book, if I may. So 
Whenever someone joins our team, Andrew gives them a copy of Let My People Go Surfing, which is the Patagonia um, sort of book on business. Uh, It's sort of one of the most interesting books about capitalism, I think, that you could probably read. So I just started rereading it recently, and I just find the pros and the pictures and the concepts really nice. So that's, that's my pick. Awesome. And then I guess just to wrap up, if people want to follow you, if they want to follow Textile, where can they do that? Yeah. So textile.io is the main webpage. And, um, you know, that's a sort of classic landing page for a small technology company. There's really, that's the, you go there and then find other links. But on, we are, we use Twitter a good bit. So that's textile.io is the handle there. And then our docs page is a pretty great place to start. And we've just put a bunch of effort into that. So docs.textile.io. I'm Carson Farmer on pretty much every platform that a developer might be interested in. So GitHub, Twitter, well, I don't know, is there anything else really? Um, <laughs> and uh, Andrew is Andrew X Hill on most social things as well. And um, yeah, you can find us there. You can find us on the, you know, uh, there's some IPFS Reddit channels that you might want to check out. You can find us on our Slack, slack.textile.io. Come break awesome. stuff with us. Awesome. It was awesome chatting with you, Carson. Definitely interesting stuff, stuff I hadn't heard of before, but um, definitely totally interesting stuff to look into. So thanks again for joining us. Thanks, um, and have a good day, everyone. Cheers. Thanks. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com to learn more.